Would you go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 9, but hold your finger there because we're going to do a little bit of a review. We'll get to 9 in a moment and we'll stand and read God's word then. But again, I want to welcome you. And as Josh just prayed, I hope and pray that you'll be praying before we read the scripture, as we read the scripture, and after we read the scripture, that the Lord would give us insight and a willingness to submit to his word and obey his word. <clears throat> How to live in a fallen world. How to live in a fallen world while we're waiting for God's deliverance. His deliverance from our enemies and his enemies. Uh, his deliverance from our sin. His deliverance from the consequences of our sin. This is a theme running throughout the book of Daniel that has very rich application in our lives. I've mentioned more than once that we need to avoid two ditches as we look at Daniel living as an exile. The scripture says that we're exiles in 1 Peter. I told you we need to avoid two ditches. One would be to look around with disgust at the world, at, a, at our country even, and say, you know, this world is going to hell, our country is going to hell, let it burn. And just gather in your holy huddles and forget about the world. That would not be Daniel's approach. The other ditch would be to say, well, you know, this world's not so bad. I, I'm beginning to feel more and more at home in this world. Heaven is just pie in the sky when I die. I want to Invest everything I have right here, right now, and forget about eternity. That would be another ditch. Daniel would say no to that. And so in the middle, we have what we see Daniel and his friends doing. Uh, if you didn't hear the message last week from Byron, go back and listen to that because he gave some very helpful application for how we are to live in the waiting time, which is where we are. And to review a little bit of that, the book of Daniel teaches us that just as Daniel and his friends were exiles, pilgrims, aliens in a strange land, so are we. This world is not our ultimate home. Just as God showed Daniel that the trials would not end simply because they would be set free to return to Jerusalem, so too there will be trials all along our path until until we get to heaven, until the new Jerusalem comes to us. And some of these trials will be because of God's enemies and our enemies. But some of the trials that we face, some of the trials that Daniel faced, was because of their sin and the consequences of their sin. God will deliver his people, but it may not be in the time frame that they or we desire. As I mentioned, the end of the 70 years will not be the end of trials for Daniel, for the people that he loved. And this will be a constant theme until the first coming of Christ and until the second coming of Christ. But Daniel learned and teaches us well that God is never off of his throne. He is always in charge. He's always in control. God always and ultimately will put an end to his people's suffering and put an end to his enemies. In fact, this book reminds us that Jesus Christ is the only true king in his kingdom, the only true kingdom that lasts forever. All other Kings and kingdoms come and go. This is a review, but we need to hear it again. It sounds very similar to what Jesus said in John 16, 4 and 33. He said, but these things I have spoken to you so that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you this. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. In other words, Jesus was telling his disciples, it's going to get rougher before it gets better. And he says, I'm telling you that so that when it gets rougher, you won't be caught off guard. And that was applicable to them 2,000 years ago. But listen to verse 33. This is for you and for me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. 
You will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So how should we live in the here and now? Uh, waiting on God's deliverance. We're sojourners. We're aliens. We're pilgrims. How should we live? Well, again, some of this is just a quick bullet point review from last week's message and, and the previous messages. But number one, we should weep. We should not look around and go, this world's going to hell, let it burn. We should weep over our own godlessness. And we should weep over other Christians' godlessness. And we should weep for the lost. The reason Daniel so dramatically reacted to these visions was because he knew that God's people, he knew that he had sinned against holy God. He had broken, they had broken God's law and heart and they would be taken to the woodshed. And it broke his heart. He couldn't fathom the people of God being disciplined because of their wickedness with a smile on his face. And so in the time while we're waiting on God's deliverance, we should be weeping over our godlessness, the church's godlessness, and even the lost. Secondly, we should learn to live with mystery. You're not going to understand everything in the Bible. You're not going to understand everything in God's providence along the path until the Lord returns. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you that next week you're going to hear a message that you're not going to understand all together. And I don't either. I'm going to do my best to preach it faithfully and accurately, but we will probably disagree on some things. And it's okay because it's not salvific. We're going to have to learn to live with mystery. You know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? People would come to Daniel and say, interpret my dream. Daniel didn't even understand his own dreams. Have you thought about that? And even when there would be an interpretation given, he would still scratch his head and say, I don't get it all. So we've got to learn to live with mystery and yet not let that paralyze us to say, I'm not getting up from this couch until I understand every word in the Bible. That would be a fool's errand. We have to, Daniel had to live, function, serve others, worship God which was a good point that Byron brought up in last week's message. It's Daniel chapter 8, verse 27. And he says that he went about the king's business. Even though he was still confused a little bit about what this vision was going to mean and how it would unfold, and even though he was heartbroken because what he did understand is, God, our trials aren't going to end at the end of 70 years, are they? Uh, you're still, you're still going to do some things in our lives because we haven't quite learned the lesson just because we're going to be brought back to Jerusalem doesn't mean that we're going to be brought back with a new heart. And there's still chastisement and discipline that await us, and it broke his heart. But it didn't paralyze him. He got up, and he went about the king's business, and that's what you and I must do. The king's business, capital T, capital K, and the king's business, little t, little k. we got to get busy about our Lord's work, but we got to get busy about our jobs, where we work, play, and live. And how are you doing with that? How are you doing where you work, where you play, where you live, where you serve? How are you doing at loving God and serving others? How are you doing effectively laying the black velvet, so to speak, through excellence, through good works for the glory of God, so that when you put the diamond of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it sparkles and pops from the black velvet of, a, of an excellent and Godward life. And these are things that we learn in the book of Daniel. But another thing that we must be doing as we're waiting on God's deliverance, as we're living in the here and now as aliens, pilgrims, strangers, we must be praying. We must be praying. In fact, that's what Daniel 9 verses 1 through 22 and 3 are about. Some say that if God is sovereign, why pray? Have you ever heard that? That's really a poor question, isn't it? If God were not sovereign, why pray? 
right? Why would you talk to a God who can't do anything about stuff? Don't, don't pray. Just go out and do it yourself. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps and make it happen. But no, he is sovereign. And since he is sovereign, we pray. That is certainly Daniel's logic. He was reading Jeremiah 25. He was reading Jeremiah 29, where it said, In 70 years I will have my people in captivity, and then I will destroy the Babylonians for their afflicting of my people, and then I will return my people back to Jerusalem. He's reading that, and he's doing the math, and he's thinking, hey, it's, it's almost been 70 years. And that didn't stop him from praying, God, deliver us. God, rescue us. God, change our hearts. It didn't stop him from doing that. It poured gas on the fire for him to do that. And that's how it always should be. God's word and God's promises should put a fire in us to pray. It should never dampen our prayer lives. It should never make us say, oh, well, God's going to do what God's going to do. Let him do it, and I'll sit and eat and drink and be merry. Daniel is in his 80s at this point. He's reading through Jeremiah 25 and 29, and it puts a fire in him to pray this wonderful prayer that we're about to read in chapter 9. But speaking of how God's Word uh, informs and emboldens our prayers, listen to, to what Ralph Davis says about prayer in the Word. It's quite simple. The Lord's promises drive His servants to prayer. It's as if God's promises have Velcro on them, and our prayers are meant to get stuck there. I love that. He says... As Daniel is reading God's Word, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 29, it directs him, it emboldens him to pray passionately. This is Daniel's way. This is God's way. Let Scripture drive prayer. Let Scripture drive prayer. Let Scripture drive prayer. You heard me a minute ago. I said we need to be praying before we read the Bible, as we read the Bible, and after we read the Bible. And this is a way that prayer and God's Word connect. Well, would you please, after that lengthy introduction, would you please stand, and we're going to read the prayer that Daniel prayed. And as we read this, we're going to identify and apply five very instructive truths that will help us in our time of waiting for God's deliverance. Notice the ACTS that we do every Sunday morning. Notice how it is a part of this strategy in Daniel's prayer life. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from Your commandment and rules." We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as to this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you." To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the, of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. 
All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all the calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have made a name for yourself, as to this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and the iniquities of our fathers Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all around us. Now therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his plea for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord, make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own name's sake, O my God, because your city and your people who are called by your name. And while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord, my God, for the holy hill of my God, there, there I was speaking in prayer, and the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me, saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. You may be seated. I don't know if you could follow along with that logic, but we do see A-C-T-S in there. Not quite that neatly compartmentalized, but they're interwoven throughout this prayer. What a beautiful model prayer we have here. As a matter of fact, that's where we get the idea of praying A-C-T-S. You, you probably know that, right? We didn't come up with A-C-T-S and then the Bible catch up with our wisdom. It's the other way around. So what can we glean from this? I told you five very instructive uh, truths that will help us in our time of waiting. First thing I want to show you, you might have overlooked it, is in verse 21 and 22. Daniel, as he's praying, Gabriel comes to him and says, Hey, I heard your prayer the first time you, you uttered the words, and I've come to give you assurance that God has heard it and God's going to answer it. But he says in verses 21 and 22, it's almost a throwaway phrase, but he says that, that uh, Gabriel came to him at the time of the evening sacrifices. That's very interesting. They weren't having evening sacrifices in Babylon. But Daniel, it was so etched into his spiritual DNA that at 3 p.m., you go to the temple and you put forth the, the sacrifices on a daily basis and you pray and worship God that when Gabriel came to him, he just happened to think, hey, it's, he didn't think, hey, he came to me at three o'clock. He thought he came to me at the time of the evening sacrifices. And think about that. It had been 70 years since Daniel had partaken of that. But that was so ingrained in his spiritual DNA. There were some things that Babylon simply couldn't erase out of a heart that loved God and loved the means of God's grace. Daniel kept 
the calendar kept the clock in a liturgical fashion. I just think that's fascinating. It reminds me of Psalm 122, verse 1, where the psalmist says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us go into his sanctuary to worship him. One time back in my time in Memphis, before I became a pastor, I was a youth minister, and my pastor made a very insightful uh, comment to a a friend there, a, a fellow church member. This man was praying about moving to a different city for job-related purposes. And he came to our pastor and he was asking for, for wisdom, for counsel, for prayer. And he said, you know, I'll, I'll be making more money. Um, it, there's a better school system where I'd be going for my children. Um, it, it's in a beautiful part of the country and I just can't see any downside to it. I, I think it's a no-brainer. I think God opened this door for me to go, but I just like to have prayer and know what my pastor thought about it. And my pastor, his pastor said, are there any good churches within driving distance of where you would be going? And he said, well, I, that's never crossed my mind. I don't know. And he said, well, why don't you do some research and find out if there's any healthy churches within driving distance of where you'd be living. And so it, it caught the man off guard. Matter of fact, it caught me off guard. But the man did some research and about a week later came back and said, you know, there's not. There's, there's not a healthy church anywhere around where I would be living. And so Pastor Charlie said, well, then there's your answer. God doesn't want you to go there. And you might think that's too bold. You might think that's spot on. Um, at the time, I thought it was too bold. But looking back, I think it was spot on. Now, here's the thing. The man heard him and heeded his counsel and didn't move. Stayed right there and continued worshiping at First Baptist Rossville, where we were. Um, do, you, do you care that much about God and and the corporate worship of God, that you would move or not move based upon would we be involved in a healthy church if we did? That's just something to think about. And, and that's what, you know, you might think, well, what's the point here? Well, Daniel had that kind of heart. He, he's like 70 years later, uh, after he's had the time in the temple and the sacrifice, Gabriel comes to him and he says, oh, he came right at the time of the evening service. This is just the way Daniel thought. He was so God-centered and God-saturated. He loved God and he loved the worship of God that he, he, he kept the clock by the time for sacrifice. And I would just commend that to you. And, and if you don't have that kind of love for God and for the worship of God, for the church of God, Pray, even now, God, you, you did that in Daniel. You put that fire in Daniel. Put that fire in me. Second thing I want to commend to you is verses 22 and 23, where, again, after he's recognizing that Gabriel's coming during the time of the evening sacrifice, he, he hears the answer that Gabriel has. And would you look at it with me again in verse 22 and 23? It says, he made me understand speaking with me and saying, oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding at the beginning of your plea for mercy. A word went out and I have come to tell it to you for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. You know, Daniel might have been thinking, I don't know if God's hearing my prayer. Have you ever felt that way? But, and I, I've never had an angel come to me and, and say, hey, I, God heard that prayer, and I'm here to give you God's answer. And by the way, you're greatly loved, so keep on praying, because God loves to hear from you. I've never had that happen to me. Have you ever had that happen to you? But we can tell by the character of God that this is not just some unique set of circumstances for Daniel. 
God loves his children. God loves to hear from his children. God is the prayer hearing, the prayer answering God. And all of those who are in Christ have a, a spiritual birthright to go to God as father. And God never gets tired of hearing from us because he loves us. The word love here literally means covet. It means being precious. It's like God is saying, I, 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 you're precious to me, Daniel. I love you. I covet you. And I believe he's saying that about each one of his children. Church, we are chosen before the foundation of the world. We're loved with an everlasting love. We're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells us. We've been adopted into God's family. That, those are things Daniel didn't even know about. Those are new covenant promises that Daniel could only look through a glass dimly and conceive of. But we know these things in living color. And listen, God immediately answered his prayer. And that's, that's what Gabriel's saying. Say, hey, I, we, we heard you the first time you made a plea for mercy. And here's the answer. And so they would begin to be brought back to Jerusalem right after this moment. God is fulfilling his promise. But in an already not yet fashion that we're growing accustomed to in the book of Daniel and other parts of the Bible too, God partially answered his prayer. Listen to uh, what DeGuid says about it. We shall see in our study in chapter 9, verse 24 and following, the message that, that the angel Gabriel brought to Daniel was both immediate and partially fulfilled. The problem of Israel's rebellious heart that caused the exile in the first place would not be dealt with merely by bringing them back to the land. It would require a much more awesome demonstration of God's grace and greatness, which could only be accomplished at the coming of Jesus Christ. So here we go. The, that's the th first two things. Now I want to give you three other points out of this prayer, and it's, it's A, C, S. We, we could probably pull a T out of this because the part where he says, you are the God who has delivered your people out of the land of Egypt and brought us into a new land. He's, he's thinking back of God's past faithfulness, and that propels him to look ahead at, God, you've done it before. You'll do it again. But we surely see an A and a C and an S here. Now, I love how it's just interwoven. There's not a section in here that's the adoration, a section that's confession, and a section that's supplication. It's just interwoven together. We should pray for ourselves. We should pray for the church. We should pray for the world. Yes. But notice how even as Daniel is doing that, he is intermingling adoration for God, confession of sin, supplication. And so here we go, adoration. Throughout this prayer, God's covenant name is, is used. And this should strike our attention to show us that Daniel is really thinking, God, you took initiative to make a covenant with us. Now, there's a compare and contrast here. And he's saying, in essence, God, you are the faithful one. We are not faithful. But I think the logic is saying, God, you are the great covenant maker and keeper. We have broken our end. But please, with the same initiative, the same mercy, the same grace that you took in the beginning of making a covenant with us, would you use that same initiative, that same mercy and grace to now take initiative and restore and cleanse and rescue and renew your wayward children? In this adoration, I see at least two major themes, the greatness of God and the grace of God. And I want to show you some verses for your future consideration. The greatness of God and the grace of God. Look at verses 4 and 7, verse 14 and 15 for the, the greatness of God. 
Verse 4, I pray to the Lord my God and make confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and who keep his commandments. Verse 7, to you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. Verse 14, therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works that he has done. We have not obeyed his voice. And then verse 15, and now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. That's the greatness of God. But we also see the grace of God, some of the same verses even. Again, verse 4, I pray to the Lord, my God. Notice how he's calling him my God. That's something we saw that for a while Nebuchadnezzar couldn't do, right? He would say, your God. Belshazzar, your God. Darius, your God. Cyrus, your God. Daniel says, my God. He is my God, and I'm seeking him, verses 1 through 3 show us. He says, I'm seeking my God in prayer. And so in verse 4, we, we see of the grace of God. Verse 9, follow along with me. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Literally in the Hebrew, mercy and forgiveness is in the plural. And it's saying, to him belongs wave after wave after wave of mercy and forgiveness. Verses 16 through 19. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all around us. Now, therefore... O oh, oh our God, listen to the prayer of your servant, to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O oh Lord, make your face shine upon the sanctuary which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear to hear. Open your eyes and see. You just see this again and again and again. Uh, verse 19, O oh Lord, hear and forgive. Pay attention. Act. Do not delay for your own name's sake. So when we bow and pray, we need to think about who we're talking to. We're talking to a great God, the great God. And that could almost make us not even want to come before him because we're not great. And we, like Daniel, as we'll see in the time of confession, uh, his greatness almost magnifies our imperfections. But we cannot separate his greatness from his grace. This is who he is. And so his grace should pull us into his presence. And we come boldly through the precious blood of Christ. So I would say this. When God is small, people are big. We looked at that two weeks ago. But also when God is small, our prayers are small. But the opposite would be true. When God is big, when we see him in pro proportions that the Bible outlines for us, then it draws us to pray big prayers, and it draws us to pray for grace. You know, when our view of God's grace is small, we're very legalistic in our lives. We're very harsh on others. We're quick to judge we're slow to pray. But when we are properly seeing the dimensions of God's grace, it gives us hope. It gives us hope in our own sanctification when someone sins against us rather than just being all offended and put out and, and just walking away and leaving that relationship. We say in private prayer, oh God, this is your child. This is your child who sinned against me. Please sanctify him. Please sanctify her the way you're sanctifying me because the truth is, is I'm just as big a sinner as she is. I'm just as big a sinner as he is. So may this prayer and as a constant reading of God's word, may it give us proper dimensions of the greatness of God and the grace of God, which will make our prayers big 
and we'll make our times of praying for grace and showing grace to people very productive. Now, let's go to the next one, C. That's adoration, but what about confession? Did, did you notice the compare and the contrast? Again, when, when Daniel properly saw God's greatness and grace, it, it showed him his own heart and his people's heart. He, he, would, he would not go very far in praising God before he would stop and say, but, but we're not like you. You're the great covenant maker and keeper, but we broke our end of the deal. And this is what a proper view of God does. It shows us a proper view of ourselves. That's what Calvin said. A proper view of God shows us a proper view of ourselves. So look at some confession times and some compare and contrast. I'll just briefly go through these. Look at verses 5 and 6. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandment and your rules. Verse 6. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Isn't that interesting? That would be the equivalent today because the canon is closed. We're not having uh, prophets come out and speak a fresh word from God. We're having people say, thus saith the Lord, and point to chapter and verse. That would be today like us saying, we have not obeyed the Bible. We have not read it. Or when we have read it, we just haven't obeyed it. Or we've picked the parts of the Bible that we like and we want to obey, but we've sort of turned the page quickly when it convicts us of our sin. And we don't really want to deal with that. And this is what Daniel was saying in his day. Verses 10 and 11, We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in His laws, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets, Verse 11, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse has come upon us. Verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all of this calamity has come upon us. This is probably the worst part of the confession. Because he's saying, just as it was spoken, you know, God kept warning them, if you keep stiffening your neck and hardening your heart, if you keep chasing the idols of the land, I'm going to bring down the hammer. And he did, but notice verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. We know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down in chapter 3, but those are the only three that didn't bow down. Everyone else bowed. So Daniel is like looking over the landscape of his people and he's saying, God, we're about to go back to Jerusalem just like you promised. But I fear that we're going to go back to Jerusalem with just as hard a heart as we had when we got brought to Babylon. And he knew that just a change of zip code was not what it was going to take. But notice he doesn't say them. God, they are so terrible. Help them. Oh, God, these people that I have to put up with, can you believe it? He says, we, us, our Daniel knew that he was prone to wonder. He knew that they needed more than a mere external return to Jerusalem. He, they needed heart surgery. They needed a Savior who was bigger than just a location. Jonathan, or John Newton, rather, I believe he was the one who said, We are great sinners but Christ is a greater Savior. And so I just encourage you in your time of confession, confess your sins as well as the sins of your brothers and sisters that you can see. Don't, don't have a harsh they, them, help them, God. Pray like Daniel prayed. Help us. Uh, pray desperately knowing that only a work of the Spirit and only Christ Himself, your high priest, can change your heart, can change their heart. 
can make you truly the man of God that he wants you to be, the woman of God that he wants you to be. And lastly, we get to the supplication. Verse 15 and 16 really show a turning point in this prayer. In verse 15, we see, and now. It's like verses 1 through 14, we're just kind of warming up the engine. You know, he's, he's thinking about who God is. He's recalling the, the acts that God has done in the past, and it's warming his heart. He's confessing his sin and the sins of his brothers and sisters. And now he gets down to the matter at hand, verses 15 and 16. He says, and now, O Lord our God, who brought out your, your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has made a name for yourself as to this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. And here's his real request. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. I love how he prays. He prays the way Moses prayed in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verses 15 through 19. Notice these similarities. Moses said to God, Now if you slay this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, Because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he promised them by an oath. Therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. But now I pray, O Lord... Let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the third and fourth generations. But pray, I pray, pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your love, just as you have also forgiven this people. You know, Moses was saying, God, if you don't, Deliver us. If you're not going to go with us, we don't even want to go. And if you don't deliver us, it's going to be a blight on your name and reputation. People will see this and will say, God couldn't finish what he started. And this is how Daniel is making prayer. He's saying, God, we're not praying this on account of our merit on account of our worth. We don't deserve this. We didn't deserve you to take the initiative in making a covenant with us. And we don't deserve you giving us second and third and tenth and hundred chances. But we're not praying on the basis of our worth or our merit. We're praying on the basis of your mercy, your grace, your glory, your reputation. God, you've started this work for your name's sake, for your name's sake, finish this work. God, show up and show out or we are shipwrecked and sunk and your name and fame are going to take a hit. Is that how you pray? Are you praying for specific Request, but tying it in to the glory and fame and reputation of God. That's how we should pray. This is, this is a biblical model prayer for us. If you haven't already jotted down Psalm 50 verse 15, do that and memorize it. It's a great little succinct prayer that can help un uncork this from your prayer life. It says, Call upon the Lord in your time of trouble. He will rescue you and you will honor and glorify him. In a minute, I'm going to pray for us and, and I'm, I'm going to get nitty gritty in some prayer requests. And I'm going to pray for your glory. Show up and show out in this marriage. For your glory show up and show out in this church for your glory show up and show out in our country and and with those who are hurting financially and with those who are hurting in relationships and those who are hurting physically and with their health would you show up and show out god yes because you love your people but even more than that would you show up and show out so that your name will be treated as holy so that your name will be glorified, so that your fame will spread. This is a biblical way to pray. 
So I hope that's been helpful to you. Go back. I've gone through this so quickly, uh, but there's A, there's C, there's S, and let that inform and energize your prayer life. There's one final little nugget here that we see uh, toward the end. It's where Gabriel's talking to him again, and he says, he says two things that are kind of opposite almost. He says, um, where is it? While I was speaking, praying, confessing my sins, uh, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in a swift time at the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to you uh, to, to give you insight and understanding. So there it is, the first part. I've come to give you insight and understanding. And then look at the verse 23. At the beginning of your pleas uh, for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Literally, ponder, scrutinize the vision. And I just love that. That's a great word to end here with before we pray. Um, the, the angel Gabriel says two things. He says, I've come to give you understanding. So that's the word illumination. And then he says in verse 23b, he says, Now, you go and you work hard at pondering, at considering the vision. And if you've read verse 24 through 27, you know there's some things to ponder there. So it's both and. It's illumination and it's perspiration. And we can wreck in either ditch. We can be those people that just... Study the Bible in all its original, uh, in all the commentaries, and just really study God's Word. But do in it as though it all depends upon us. And never thinking like Psalm 25 verse 5 says, which says, guide me into your truth, O God. Or like Psalm 119 verse 18 says, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. And let's don't wreck in that ditch. But let's not wreck in the other ditch either, which is to just kind of sit back and say, well, you know, this is a complicated book. Nobody's going to understand it. So let's just, you know, let's just pray. And if God's will is to show us what this means, then he'll show us. And if it's not his will that we understand it, he won't show it to us. That would be a, a ditch. For 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, it says, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Acts 17, 11, the Bereans, they searched the scriptures after Paul would finish his sermon. They would, I'm sure they'd walk up, shake his hand, say, hey, good message. But then they'd go back home and they would open up the word of God, which they had the Old Testament. And they would go through and just make sure that what Paul said was true and accurate. I remember Josh telling me one time that one of his friends had invited him to hear him preach. And he said, I'm preaching uh, tomorrow night. Come hear me preach. And Josh said, well, what are you preaching on? He said, I don't know. The Spirit hasn't given it to me yet. And that makes me very scared. So, so that brother, if he is a brother, uh, was wrecking in, in that ditch. You know, we're just going to kind of coast and the spirit will, he'll, he'll let it flow. Well, let's don't wreck in that ditch, but let's not wreck in the other ditch either of never praying for the spirit to illuminate and give us insight that we could never have on our own. And remember, Daniel had, he had to live with some mystery even after the interpretation was given to him. He still didn't get it all. And I got a feeling we won't get it all either, but let's not lay back and quit trying. So that's the prayer. That's the, you know, what, how are we to live in a, in a fallen world while we're awaiting deliverance? We're to weep for the lost. We're to learn to live with mercy. We're to be about the king's business and we're to pray earnestly. And Daniel has taught us better how to pray earnestly. So now if you would, what has God said to you out of this message? What has God said to you? And by His grace and for His glory, what are you going to do about it? Now, as you ponder that question, 
I'm going to pray for us. So you join with me and pray in your heart. And then Byron's going to lead us in a song. And then we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. We'll be singing, Come ye sinners, poor and needy. So what has God said? And by His grace and for His glory, what are you going to do about it? Let's bow and pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, our one true and living triune God. We've been reminded this morning that you alone are truly great. You alone are truly gracious. God, you're showing us in the book of Daniel that yours and yours alone is the kingdom and the power and the glory. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are great and gracious. From everlasting to everlasting, we are yours. We're your people. Bought and paid for by your dear son. Jesus, you are our deliverer, our rock our Savior, our God. Time and time again, you have intervened for our good and your glory. This gives us great hope that you will continue to intervene for our good and your glory. May we be the people of Psalm 15 here at Providence who call upon you in our time of trouble. And when you rescue us, we glorify and honor you. Lord, our, our contemplation of your grace and your greatness, it, it reminds us that we have sinned and fall short. You're reminding us in this prayer in Daniel 9 that we're never to come before you on the basis of our accomplishments, our merit, our track record. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this is why we most gladly come before you in and through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's what we're celebrating today at the Lord's Supper. That it is only by the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our faith in him that we can approach you with such confidence. Lord, Daniel got very specific on their disobedience. I, I think sometimes we are just quick to say, yeah, I'm a sinner, forgive me, pass the salt. But the truth is, Lord, we have not loved you as we ought. And we've not even been grieved for not loving you as we ought. Let us be like those brothers and sisters that I read about this week who when the name of Christ was being trampled underfoot, they said, I will take a stand and wash this shame from the face of Jesus Christ. God, we don't seek you through prayer and the word enough. We've not served others in your name as we ought. We haven't shared the gospel with them as we ought. We haven't even been broken enough for their souls. We've not looked at our job, our neighborhood, our spare time as a mission field. And we're certainly lazy about fulfilling the Great Commission God, we've not looked at menial tasks such as changing diapers or putting in an honest day's work or praying for our leaders, both civil and clergy, as important acts of worship and witness that really matter to you.
In short, God, we have sinned. We have fallen short of your glory. We are great sinners. And we are so thankful for Jesus, who is our greater Savior. And now, Lord, we want to pray, make supplications and requests. We pray based upon your character, based upon your glory and your fame, that you would show up and show out in our lives, in our church here at Providence, and in all your true churches. And do it for your great name and worth. Unbelievers are watching and scoffing. We hear it all the time. Deliver us from ourselves. Wake us up in areas where we are asleep at the will. Use us to pray for the sanctification of our brothers and sisters and use us to spread the gospel to those local and abroad so that you would save the lost. So that others will see how great you are. And again, God, tying this back to your reputation and glory, the way Moses prayed, the way Daniel prayed. God, you will be revered and worshipped if you save this person or that person. We're praying for individuals, but church, pray for that person, but, but pray not only for their sake, but pray, God, you will be revered and worshipped and treasured if you show up and save this person or this son, or this daughter, or this mom, or this dad, or this uncle, or this nephew, or this niece, or this aunt. The name of Jesus will be seen and savored if you restore this marriage or that marriage, if you heal this person or that person, if you assist this believer or that believer who is currently walking through the valley of the shadow of death. As Daniel taught us to pray, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, act. O oh Lord, forgive and deliver and save. O oh Lord, do not delay. Why? For your own name's sake. God, by your Holy Spirit and for your glory, would you make it so that everyone who is hearing my voice right now is really hearing your voice right now, calling calling them either for the first time or afresh and anew to turn from sin, to lean on, to trust and treasure Jesus Christ, to be satisfied with all that you promised to be for us in Jesus. And you are most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in you. And Lord God, as we sing this last song and as we partake of the Lord's Supper, may we remember you. Lord Jesus Christ, may we remember you in a fresh way, a way that reminds us that the work of our salvation is complete because of the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And may we leave today renewed in our love for you and for others, emboldened, to walk in obedience for your name's sake. Father, this we pray in the sweet and sovereign name of Jesus. And God's people said,